Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker for today in part of our entrepreneurial talks, we have the CEO and founder of Nearby, as he was mentioning, which was formerly known as Groupon. So, ladies and gentlemen, please bring out with a really loud round of applause for Mr. Ankur Variku. Give it up for Mr. Ankur Variku! It's almost an embarrassing introduction coming through. I've never felt like a rock star before. <laughs> Thank you. Saturday morning, nippy, Delhi, rainy weather, and that's all I needed to freshen myself up. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for for having me. I know there was a lot of back and forth. Saranch was quite persistent and made some schedules work. Uh, I love spending my time with uh, students particularly because honestly, we're, we're doing what we have to do, but if you guys do what we would expect you all to do, then this country will be a completely different country from what we see today. And um, I think that in my own small way, whatever experiences I've gathered, being an entrepreneur, being a professional, being exactly an MBA student, which is what most of you are, uh, I graduated out of ISB 10 years back. It seems uh, a fairly long time. It is actually a long time. And uh, so much has changed and yet so much has still remained the same, particularly in how you all think and behave. Um, I go to ISB quite often. Um, that one year at that school completely changed me as an individual, so it's my small way of giving back. Uh, and one thing that I've observed over these last 10 years is the the insecurities, the, the self-doubt, the absolute confusion over what you should be doing, whether what you're doing is the right thing or not, just persists. It, it doesn't change. You, you would figure that with all the information that's available for all of you at your disposal, every hour, every second, uh, all of us would be a lot more informed either about the world outside or about our own selves. But uh, surprisingly, things are, are pretty much the same. And that's nothing wrong because you figure stuff out as you move along. But there was one thing I particularly wanted to, to talk to you all about uh, this morning, which uh, I felt very strongly over these last few years, particularly uh, what's changing around the world. So just to give you a sense, um, I come from a time, and some of you may relate to it, some of you wouldn't, but I come from a time where uh, incoming calls on the mobile phone were charged. I used to pay for that. Uh, there was no Reliance Geo, there was no large billionaire doling out free calls. Incidentally, I, I took an Uber right now. I'm completely on Uber, uh, which was also a big change. And the driver just, because I think he was getting bored, he's like, sir, you know that Airtel has calls free. Kar li hai. And then we had this nice, happy conversation where he was comparing Airtel and Geo, and then he started comparing Uber and Ola. And it's just fascinating how these people who perhaps have not gone to college are so smart about the choices that they're making in life. He's like, sir, I Ola use karta tha, par unhone scheme ban kar di, to main Uber chala gaya. And ab main char din use karunga, fir jab unki scheme wapas aa jayegi, main wapas Ola mein chala jaunga. And they're optimizing, like they're, they're pretty much doing the same linear programming that you do in your Excel sheets. They're doing it in their head. They don't need an Excel sheet to do all of that. Uh, but that world's changed. So you no, know, I come from a time where everything was not as easily accessible as it is for you all. And if I go back and I look at my parents and, and my generation, I think the, the thing that used to stand out as perhaps a way of measuring success or predicting whether someone would be successful or not would be hard work and intelligence. And there was this era where if you had high IQ, you were likely to succeed. You were, if you had gone to the best colleges and you no know, colleges whose first two alphabets are I, I, you know, then you're there, right? you, you, you're absolutely there. People will chase you because you've proven that you've belled the cat and you've given this and blah, blah, blah. And most of the successful people that you look from, particularly my parents and our generation as well, have these very traditional stamps on their resume. And What's happened dramatically in the last 10 years, particularly in the last five, is that the world has just seriously exploded. Exploded in terms of just sheer information hitting all of you 
in fact, all of us together. Right? So there's Facebook, and then Google has gone to a different level, and then there's all the internet that's coming through, and everything that hits us, whether it's the options of buying whatever you want to, learning what you need to, instantaneous gratification, and all of that. But what it's also brought along is the fact, and that's my strong belief now, something that we follow at Nearby, is IQ has begun to become less and less of a predictor of success. Hard work has become less and less a predictor of success because there are people who are working hard, or at least they claim that they're working hard, or they think that they're working hard. But where I feel there is a massive leverage that one can create and truly stand up is focus. Because in today's world, the seriously hard thing to do is to focus. Because everything around us is telling us not to focus. Every ping on our smartphone is telling us, look at me, there's someone who sent you a message. All the posts that you've put, and there's someone who's telling you, oh my God, you've got so many likes, you've got so many shares, you're getting this traction on your social network and so on, and people love you, or you have such an awesome life when you know that you don't at some level. But everything is telling you that this is the drug you need to ride on. So we are binding ourselves to this entire commotion where we're number one, placing our measurement of success or failure on these platforms. It's not so much of how great a person we are and whether we're conducting ourselves in the right way or whether we're thinking about the right way. It's about how many likes did my post get? It's about how much was it shared? Like did, did my message on WhatsApp on that group that I have for my school friends generate that kind of reaction and the thumbs up and all the emoticons and blah, blah, blah. But that's what's become there. And unfortunately, the result of that is we don't know what it is to truly immerse ourselves into something for even five minutes. Leave our phones out, leave the social media, leave the electronic media, leave everything that there is which we think is necessary for our success or our existence and just immerse ourselves into something that is truly magnificent. And I was reading this book and I'll encourage you to find what that book is that I'm referring to because I wouldn't give the name, that's always easy. The author of that book, who is a very seasoned professional in the country, was like, the way we're bringing up our kids, it's just such a wrong way of doing so because you're not parents, some of you are, I'm a parent and I'm guilty of that as much as the book mentioned. I have a five-year-old son and he would be playing Whatever it is, he's drawing, he's building something with clay, he's building something with Lego and so on, and then there's dinner time. So as soon as there's dinner time, the thing that we say is, come and have dinner. Whether let's have dinner. Whether it's time, stop everything, have dinner, have dinner. And he says that's such a wrong thing to do because what you don't recognize is if he has the ability to completely immerse himself into something and forget everything, food, sleep, definitely not social media for him, but equated to ourselves, that's a quality that if he inherits from you, just as part of parent training, he will thank you for his rest of his life. Because that's something that none of us today have. Go back and see when was the last time you were able to read or truly watch a video that was intellectual. I'm not talking Game of Thrones, right? I'm saying <laughs> Ted. I'm talking something which is truly meaningful, the Tim Ferriss show, all these names. Perhaps you don't know about them, but you should. Or you're reading great authors and you truly absorb that content without being shaken up by the world around you, because without the music in the background or the pings that are coming in and everything like that. And you'll find that it's genuinely hard for all of us to do that. So my firm belief is that particularly for this generation, focus is the new IQ. Focus is the new IQ. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Because guess what? If you have the ability to just concentrate on something for 5, 10, 15 minutes, truly absorb that content, you will be ahead of the curve. Because even the smartest people are being drugged by this thing called well, let's just call it the internet, so as to blame. Like, and it's, it's unfortunate that I stand here as the representative of that industry, but I'm equally guilty of everything that we're doing. It's part of the trade. How many of you know of this gentleman called Simon Sinek? Yeah, some of you, well. And Simon Sinek uh, is most famous for this great talk that he gave at TED 
uh, which was the golden circle. He illustrated what makes great organizations and leaders truly stand out, which is his claim to fame, but ever since he's just become this intellectual that uh, has very deep thoughts, particularly tries and diagnoses why some things are, why some things are not. Um, go and look up his recent conversation on the millennials. Uh, it's trending. It's a fascinating piece of conversation. Eight minutes of absolute pleasure. And he tells us why is it that all of us, when we particularly go to work, will find that we're not who we thought we were. We've been treated in a very different way from who we thought we were because so far our parents, particularly Indian parents, have made us grow up saying, you're awesome, you're great, oh my God, that's such a lovely painting, oh my God, you did this. Like, we're never thin, we're always kamzor ho gaya. Right? And even if you're fat, it's like, it's healthy. Hai. Right? So it's just this thing that you're never wrong. And then this fact that we have everything at our disposal, everything. And it goes on to say, and you guys will relate to that, that there was a time when our generation had to struggle to find someone that we could go out to for a date. Right? We generally had to make our moves. We generally had to find, hey, where is it that can find smart women that I can relate to and then have a conversation and perhaps ask her out. But today it's just swipe right, that's it, <laughs> done. Right? You don't have to do anything. And that's what he's talking about. It's this instantaneous drug that we are hooked on to. And there's a scientific reason behind it. Go and read it out. I'm not gonna disclose everything and take his sheen away. But the fact is, when you hear that conversation, you recognize that we are actually being drugged every day. Like there is an age limit to when you can start drinking, not that you guys follow it, but there is. There is an age limit to something. There are drugs that are banned, but then there is this whole media out there whose only and only purpose is to get us addicted. And we are addicted. It's ironic I stand here and say this in front of you because I am addicted to my phone as well. Like each time my son draws a family picture, I'm always holding a mobile phone. That's what he recognizes his dad to be. And that's very true because I always have my phone with me. I'm addicted to that. But I've always also built on that fact that, hey, I can focus when I want to. And that's my admission that you have to as well. When you do that, there are two things that happen. Number one is you're able to realize who you truly are. The biggest inadequacy that we all face today is that we think we are someone because of what the world tells us, not of whether we have concluded that in our own ways. I have this thing that I say that we let someone else's opinion of us become our reality. We're living in a world where someone else's opinion of us is our reality. So we think that we are cool because people have called us cool. We think we're not cool because people have not called us cool. We think we're successful because people are saying that we're successful. So look at the environment right now as well. There will be people who've got placed in the second year and you'll be thinking, oh my God, he scored it or she scored it because of the salary that they've got, the company they're joining, the title that they have, so on and so forth. But what if that individual truly wanted that job that's perhaps not paying as much, but will make them genuinely happy? But they're being led to believe that that's not success. That's not something that they should have signed up for because why would you pay so much to be at such a great institute and then sign up for a job that doesn't pay as well? That doesn't even make sense. Like, why would you do that? But the fact is that we're writing someone else's definition of success and failure as ours. So when you truly focus, you hear your own self. It's almost meditative. And fortunately, we don't have meditation as a core subject in particularly a business school, which I would love to. Uh, one of our founders at Symbiasis uh, studied at, uh, sorry, one of our founders at Nearby studied at Symbiasis. And uh, I don't know if you know, but they have a mandatory seven day Vipassana trip that all students have to make, which I thought was terrific. It's just so much of sense because that seven days when you're not talking to someone, how many of you know of Vipassana? Hey, it's, if you can, please go. Right? Uh, in fact, I would suggest that before you j join your next job, once you get out of it, just go. Spend those seven days with your own self. You don't talk to anyone. There is no phone. You can't read stuff. You can't write stuff. There is no television. There is no access to the world. You're just sitting with your own self. Guess how hard that is. And he said, this is Ravi I'm talking about. He's a founder. He said, when you go to Vipassana, 
you realize that the most difficult person that you live with is your own self. <laughs> because you can't just deal with your own thoughts. Like they just run away. They just don't contain themselves. And that's what the job is. It says, how can you truly control what is it that you're feeling so that you stop reacting? We go through these motions where we're supremely happy or supremely depressed and these we just don't know how to handle it. But what it says is just remain calm. Like, Right? This is this equilibrium that you have. And focus allows you to do that. That's number one. Number two, it also gives you a sense of purpose that is not driven by someone else. It tells you what is it that you perhaps genuinely want in life. I can guarantee that most of you in this room do not know what you want out of life. And that's okay. That's absolutely fine given where you are. The hard thing is, we're not doing something about it either. It's not that you're waking up every morning saying, why is it that I should wake up? What is my purpose? Why should anyone care? What is it that I truly want to do? And we don't read enough. We don't walk enough. We don't get inspired enough. So I always ask this, and this is a fact. You all came in here, maybe because you were asked to, maybe because you did that willingly. <clears throat> and there is a team that set this up. I happen to be here. And at the end of this talk, you may feel that you're motivated and you go back. The question is, this isn't by design. It's not something that you force yourself to do. So people who are fit would know what I'm talking about. When you're fit, you have to get to a discipline. Right? You have to hit the gym every day. You have to eat right. There's a certain discipline that you have to follow to get your body in the right shape and form. It's shocking that we don't do that for our minds. It's shocking that we don't set a discipline for our own self every day, every week, every month, whatever the frequency is. We don't say, hey, I'm going to make sure that I get motivated every day by X, Y, Z. We leave it to chance. We leave motivation to chance. We leave inspiration to chance. We say, okay, if that speaker shows up and I'm moved, score. But if not, I'll just go back and binge on, I don't know, Game of Thrones again or something. But the fact is that you're not setting yourself to a discipline. You're not setting yourself to a rhythm that you have to follow to make sure that you make your mind work effectively. Train it to be absolutely on top of you in every shape and form. And if you don't do that, which of course is only going to come if you have focus, then you're drifting. You're genuinely just drifting. You have no sense of where something's going to take you but you think you're working hard towards it, but you're genuinely not. There's nothing that you're doing to change your destiny, even if you thought that you couldn't. There's nothing that you're doing to influence the way that you think. You're letting people come by and it happens to be me or someone else. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, sure, better luck next time. But you're not setting up yourself in a rhythm to do that. And that's unfortunate. So until and unless you don't have focus, these two things don't come by. You don't get a true sense of who you are and you don't make the effort to sit in a disciplined mode when it comes to your brain. And that's why my admission, if there's anything that you think will be a true measure of your success going forward for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, it's inevitably going to be focus. Not how smart you are, not how hard you work, but whether you have the ability to immerse yourself into something and truly come out understanding what that piece was. Before I end, there's one thing that I would love to rest with you. The other thing that the world is getting used to is this massive sense of entitlement and is horrendously contagious. How many of you have been to a Google office ever? Okay, right, so some of you, you may know what I'm talking about. When you step into the Google office, it's the best infrastructure that you can ever think of. It's everything that you ever wanted from life, but 99.9% .9 of the world will never ever get to experience even for a day, forget, for a sustained period of time. And the one thing that I particularly, and I always speak about when I'm on these conversations, is the Google Office Lunch. It's a famous product that they've built. When you go to the Google Office and you're lucky enough that day to have lunch, you will see this massive infrastructure that has been built to feed people super smart people. And their counter, so there's this Italian counter, there's a continental counter, there's an Indian counter, there's a North Indian, sorry, there's a South Indian counter, there's a healthy counter, like all these things. And it's amazing, the assortment 
all of these for these people who are super smart. And I remember this one instance where I went there and I approached the North Indian counter because I said, okay, let's just have dal and roti. And I head toward this basket of rotis, which are of course fancily called Indian breads. And I reach out for one. And there's this guy who comes from behind the counter and says, Ruk jaiye, sir. Ye mat khaiye, ye thandi ho chuki hai. And I'm like, yeah, what? <laughs> like, what will you do with these rotis? You're not going to go back and warm them up. So like, are you going to throw them away or what not? But that's the sense that I got. And then I'm standing in the line. And then the people are like, yaar, aaj bhi dal makhni hai. Yaar, aaj bhi wahi margarita pizza. <laughs> and like, oh my God, like, what have you done? to deserve this. Like, where does this entitlement come from? Like, just go back. What is it that you've truly done? And I challenge you all to think that way because that's how I do it for myself. What is it that we have done to be sitting where we are today? And my admission is nothing, nothing. If you think that you worked hard to clear this exam and come to this college, no, don't fool yourself. We were just blessed to be born in this family that had great education at its disposal, that gave us great love and care. We went to a terrific school. We were given shelter, clothing, food, all these things that most people don't get in this world. So it's not a miracle that we're sitting here. In fact, if you weren't sitting here, that would have been a distaste. But you're here and that's absolutely fine. You've not done anything. But the insane sense of entitlement that we all have towards what we think we deserve. And when you look at Google, 65,000 people working for it and consistently ranked amongst the number one company to work for 14 years in a row, I think it's the American smartest way of figuring out what is it that works. And here's how I think about this. I don't know whether it's true or not, but this is my construct. Sergey and Larry Page, founders of Google, would have said, you know what? We're going to make the world's smartest company. The terrific engineers that no one else has. Like, think about it. Google today has the smartest engineers working for it. And we're going to give them shitloads of perks and privileges. Things that they didn't even know that they could get. We're going to give them cycles. We're going to give them free laptops. We're going to give them free food. We're going to give them sleeping pods. We're going to give them music. We're going to give them so much and stock and money. Because almost everyone will start settling in. They'll think that this is what they deserve. They think that this is what they're entitled to. But we will be constantly looking for that 1% population, those 650 odd people, whatever that number is, who will get up every morning and say, I don't deserve this shit. I haven't worked hard enough to be nearly as deserving of all that Google gives me. And those 650 people will drive the company forward, not the rest. The rest are just persisting. They're just surviving. They're just there. And if you go back, that's exactly how the world functions. Countries are managed by a handful of people, not by the entire ministry, not by the entire parliament. Companies are driven forward by a handful of truly engaged employees who feel that they don't deserve all that the companies give them, but will come in and give their best 24 hours every day. And those are the ones that move forward. And you all, me included, have this massive sense of entitlement that will kill us. Because if we're there, we're going to have a great career. Like, think about it this way. Even if you adjust for inflation, all of you are going to be earning crores and crores in 10 years from now, if not already. But the fact is, where do you truly change the equation for yourself? Because if you go back to everyone who you think is successful and you look at their life, they didn't take shit for granted. They didn't take their life for granted. They gave everything that they had and every single day to make sure that they are on top of the game. They didn't stop. You look at the Elon Musks of the world, you look at the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, forget everything else. You look at Mukesh Amani for all the good and bad things that he does. What is his incentive to get up every day and go to work. What is that guy's incentive? He's sitting on more money than he ever needs for the next hundred years if he has to. What is his incentive to get up? There must be something. I don't know what it is, but there must be something. There has to be something. And that is where you have to come in. 
that's the mindset shift that you have to make because the world will tell you, you know what, you're so awesome, I'm going to give you free food. And you will believe that shit. You will believe that you're awesome and that's why you deserve that free lunch or that snacks or that glorious offsite that they take you to. But very few will genuinely stand up every day and saying, I don't. I don't deserve this. I have got to make it work for me. I've got to step up and deliver. I constantly have to be ahead of the curve. And those are the individuals that go forward. It's not surprising that most of those individuals have focus working for them. Not IQ, not hard work, but just sheer focus. So as soon as you step out of this very nicely controlled, comfortable environment, this infrastructure that most people will not see, step into the real world, don't ever get into that mode where you think that you deserve what you're getting. Ever. Ever. I have to earn the title of the founder and CEO of Nearby every day. And I stand up in the company during my all hands or whenever is it that I engage and I tell them, I work the hardest in this company, hands down. If there's anyone else who works harder than me, I will resign. There's no one who works harder than me in this organization. Not because I have to, but because I want to. Because I don't think I've done enough to be where I am. And I've constantly have to go through. There's the people who have worked way harder than me. The people who are way smarter than me. And yet I am where I am, not because I worked hard or anything. It's just serendipity. It's just luck. I just happen to be sitting in front of you giving this sermon and you're listening as if I'm important. But the fact is, this is just luck. I've not done anything to be here. So I've got to make sure that I make this work for myself, day in and day out, day in and day out. And that's the same story that I would leave with you with. So two messages. Focus is the new IQ. Don't think that if you're smart, you're going to win this battle of life. Not anymore. You've got to have focus. And two, don't let a sense of entitlement come through. All the best with everything that you have to do for this day and, of course, your journey ahead. Um, I'd love to stay engaged. If there's anything that I can help you with, it'll be my absolute pleasure. I'm a fairly active social media guy, so just look me up. You'll find me almost everywhere, um, and I'll be happy to connect and help you with anything. Thank you so much. Thank you for being patient.